let's start at the place where we left off on last time. So just a quick recap. So I have been talking about how different tensor methods were used in high dimensional data analysis. And specifically, I plan to cover two sort of colonical examples in terms of data analysis. One is what I refer to as a, well, probably oftentimes in machine learning referred to as a unsupervised learning. The idea is, is that I focused primarily on the so-called tensor PCA method. And then well, I, the plan is for the second part of my tutorial, I'll be moving towards more supervised parts, specifically on regression. So we started with the, the unsupervised parts, specifically I focus on the so-called tensor PCA. And I focus on three different aspects, basically on the modeling, inference, and the computation involving tensor PCA. And I want to highlight essentially what I, I uh, well, what I intended to do is to highlight a row of two things. One is randomness, because I'm a statistician. I want to emphasize how, because you only have, observation, have observations from a distribution and how that affect us in terms of using different tensor methods and how to interpret the different behavior of tensors, kind of like many of, many of those facts sort of well, discussed in, in further detail in James talk earlier. And the other issue has to do with high dimensionality. And again, when it comes to tensors, dimensionality comes in multiple ways. What I had in mind specifically is when we have a, a lot of very high order tensor, let's just say for argument's sake, we look at a third order tensor, but the dimension of each mode is very, very large. So I'm changing, switching notation a little bit from JM to talk. I'm going to use D to represent the dimension of each mode. And for most of my talk, I'm going to focus on cubic tensors. So basically, I have a D by D by D multilinear array of tensors. And last time I discussed in terms of a modeling perspective, and tensors offers a lot of new sort of ingredients and a lot of nice properties from statistical modeling point of view, many of them as a result of the identifiability of tensor decomposition. But nonetheless, I think the cautionary, cautionary tale I want to emphasize is, well, all these identifiability, all these interpretability we want to emphasize, these are very fragile. And oftentimes, because of the presence of noise, all these interpretability, all these identifiability, they could be quite elusive in practice. So it's very important when you're, when you're sort of trying to extend the classical PCA into tensor PCA, that you look at the problem a little bit more carefully and modeling some of the underlying structures. And this could be, for example, the long negativity constraint or could be orthogonal decomposability of the tensor. The later one is what I'm going to focus here. And so basically I'm assuming, suppose you have a true tensor, which is orthogonally decomposable, if you add a noise to it, a random noise to it, how well can you recover it? And this leads us to the inference part. And as, as I demonstrated last time, when it comes to estimation, if you have an orthogonally decomposable tens uh, tensor as a signal, actually you can recover the signal very well, much better when compared with the matrix case. The main issue, the main benefit is now you can estimate all these so-called singular vectors essentially in isolation, which is something that's missing in the matrix case, where it's very much determined by how similar these singular values are. So of course, all of this has a practical aspect to it, all of those in, involving tensor, basically the computational issue. So, so far when we talk about the modeling and the inferences, I haven't talked about how you can derive this estimate. Actually, in the way I, I did, basically if you recall, this basically based upon your ability to compute the best Odeco approximation to a tensor. But how that can be computed, of course, in practice, could be a huge challenge. And this is what I'm going to talk about next. So from a computational point of view, Odeco tensor itself, Odeco tensors themselves actually is much easier to, much easier to deal with. Basically, well, this is a busy slide. But nonetheless, this, is, this has been discovered by many people. The basic idea is as follows. If you do have an Odeco tensor, finding its decomposition 
is not very hard. Basically, you can have random initialization and you can apply power iteration to it. And when you do that, then you will always end up, well, at least when the probability 10, when the probability one, you will always end up to end up with one of these triplets of a singular vectors. So put it in a different way. If you have Odaiko tensor, whose singular vectors are here, UJs one, two, three. And if you have a random initialization, apply power iteration, you will always end up to one of these triplets. So immediately you can devise a very efficient algorithm for this purpose. And then you can recover the composition of Odaiko tensor. But nonetheless, this is an issue that came back to our inference and the modeling part as well. This is for Odaiko tensors. But what we observe is not Odaiko tensor. What we observe is Odaiko tensor plus noise. Once you have a noise, now this becomes an issue, whether or not this power iteration I described earlier is robust. Well, in a way, you can always find if the well, in a way you can always find a bar. So if the perturbation is small enough, the previous algorithm would still work. But nonetheless, the issue is how big is the perturbation you can allow? Nonetheless, the general strategy, the first step, if you think about it, the first step of the general strategy is very simple. How can I apply this strategy for Odaiko tensors to this not Odaiko, but Odaiko tensor plus noise? And the idea would be essentially the same thing as Odaiko tensor. I start with rank one approximation. I start with random initialization. And hopefully I end up with some, something close to the best rank one approximation. And then I subtract it and do successive rank one approximation. It's very natural, very intuitive idea. But the question here is, does this work? And does, if this works, it works to what extent? And this is what we're going to find out next. And the idea basically is, if you look at them, because very much similar like the inference case, all that we're looking for the best Odaiko approximation in this successive fashion, really because all the perturbation happens essentially in isolation, everything essentially is very much similar to the rank one case. And what happens in this rank one case? Well, this is in a way the complete picture here. So again, Forget about Odaiko, for example, just for, for, for a moment. Let's just look at, the, look at the rank one case. Suppose I have a rank one tensor plus a Gaussian ensemble noise, and I observe X. And again, just like before, I'm asking myself a question. How well can I estimate these singular values, U, V, and W? Again, just to refresh your memory here, my notation as follows. I'm assuming U, V, and W, they're of unit length, so that I can interpret the lambda that's my singular value, or actually from a statistical point of view, this represents the so-called signal to noise ratio because the noise, each entry has various one and lambda essentially represents the signal to noise ratio. So again, my dimension is D, which means both U, V and uh, or U, V and W, they are unit vectors in D dimensional Euclidean space, actually on the D, the D, the, well, in the sphere in D dimensional space. And my signal strength for simplicity, let's just say my signal stress is due D to certain exponents, let's call it a psi. And a little bit of calculation, this is a recap from what I mentioned last time. If you are able to complete the best rank one approximation, and using the perturbation bounds, you can show this is the rate of convergence you can get. And you can indeed show from a statistical point of view, this is what we would call minimax lower bounds. Basically, this means the information about these singular values you can extract from X limits how well you can estimate them. And the best rate of convergence is this, is D up to one minus two psi. So basically, what does this mean? This represents the top parts of this diagram. So if you think about this, this basically is error with increasing psi. If you look at the top parts, I'm not talking about the computation. I'm just talking about from a statistical point of view, from an information theoretical point of view. There is basically two regimes. And the regime trans trans well, transitions at the point when Kasai equals to one half. What does this mean? When Kasai is smaller than one half, you look at this rate of convergence, it diverges in D, meaning that you can never get a consistent estimate because consistent means this difference 
goes to zero. So if a cosine is smaller than one half, then this of course does not converge to zero. So you cannot get a consistent estimate of u, v, or w. On the other hand, if a cosine is greater than one half, you can get a consistent estimate because when d increases, this goes to zero, and not only that, you get this rate of convergence you cannot improve. So any other estimate you would have, this is the best rate you can hope for. But so far, we're not considering competition at all. If you think about this, this is based upon our ability to compute the best rank ground approximation. And actually, we've all known that in general, well, in, at least in the worst case, this is the NP hard problem. So what if we want to restrict ourselves to the case Suppose we will have a polynomial time algorithm to compute an estimate. Then we are moving to the lower half of this diagram. Basically, we would have three different regimes. When cosine is smaller than one half, regardless of your computational ability, you won't be able to get a consistent estimate. And now what's of interest is what happens when cosine is greater than one half. Turns out there are also there are another two regimes. When cosine is greater than three half, three quarters, this is in a situation where your signal to noise ratio is high because the bigger cosine is, the bigger the signal to noise ratio. When your signal to noise ratio is greater than three quarters, there is a polytime, polynomial time algorithm that can give you a rate optimal estimate. Now, there is a gray area in between one half and three quarters. And the question to ask here would be, suppose you are only allowed to have an estimate that's polynomial time computable. Can you still achieve rate optimality? Can you achieve even consistent, just near just consistency? Well, that turns out to be still an open question. There are some evidences, well, it's, I should say, there are some evidence pointing to like in this regime, you won't be able to get a consistent estimate unless, unless in, the, in the way P equals to MP. Otherwise, so basically if, if, they are if, if they are different, then basically you won't be able to get a consistent estimate if you require poly an estimate that's polytomic time computable. So this sort of a, going back to a point I made earlier. So everything essentially has to do in a signal to noise ratio especially from a statistical point of view from if we take computation into consideration. Because if the, if the signal to noise ratio is high, the problem becomes easier and we don't need to worry about the computational difficulty and we can indeed find a good procedure to derive estimates that's really optimal. Now let me explain a little bit on how we achieve this. Suppose your signal to noise ratio is indeed high your cosine is greater than three quarters. How do we get an estimate that's not only consistent, but indeed rate optimal? Any questions here? Okay. Well, to answer this question, let's first think about, step back a little bit. Think about why this problem, computing basically this U hat, V hat, W hat here, it's just basically best rank one approximation. Let's step back and think a little bit, ask ourselves, why is this estimate difficult to compute? After all, all we are doing essentially is just trying to maximize X, which is the tensor, the noise tensor we observe. And this X, X, little X, Y, Z, these are basically unit length vectors in RD. So we are trying to maximize this with respect to little X, Y, and Z. And why is this difficult problem? This, of course, this is a polynomial optimization problem. It's very smooth. And the main challenge here is, it's also highly long convex. And as I pointed out earlier, if indeed this signal to noise ratio is very, very low, this could have a, up to exponential of the exponential of the exponential number of local, bad local optimers. So what happens is because there are so many bad local optima, it's difficult to avoid the bad ones. And this actually brings up a very important issue here I want to emphasize. When we come to this sort of competitional problems, 
a good initialization oftentimes is essential. If you can get a good initialization because of the smoothness of this objective function, then actually there are many algorithms that could be used to attain a very good, well, even if it's not the global optimum, but something very close to the global optimum. Now let's like put this strategy in practice. Coming back to our problem of computing the best rank one approximation, assuming the signal to noise ratio is high, how do we get a good initialization? The idea here is I want to have an initialization of this UVW so that they have long trivial, in, they have long trivial overlap when the truth UV and W. To put it in a different way, I want to have an initialization. Let's say we want to initialize U. I want to get an initialization of U, let's call it a U hat, so that the angle between U and U hat is actually strictly less than 90 degrees. Because in high dimension, if you randomly pick two vectors, they will be orthogonal. But I want to be able to have an initialization which gives you something not perpendicular. And how do I do this? The idea actually is fairly simple. I do spectral initialization with the matrixization. Since we are just looking at a third order tensor, I can always do this matrixization. So basically I'm converting this third order tensor into a matrix which is D by D squared. Think about it. This tensor is rank one. So this matrix is rank one. And the U will be its left, its left singular, value, singular vector. So this actually is a K point because if you think about this matrix is D by D squared, but I'm only interested in the shorter end. Now, if I add noise from T to X, so now this becomes a rank one Rank one tensor plus Gaussian ensemble. And when I do matrixization, the same thing. I'm going to end up with a rank one matrix, now also plus a Gaussian noise. The difference now becomes, again, I'm, this matrix is highly rectangular. It's D by D squared. So even though I'm only interested in the shorter end, the singular vector on the shorter end, I cannot take a full advantage of the fact that it's only dimension D. But nonetheless, you will realize with a little bit of calculation from the help of random matrices, you realize this U hat, this initialization is indeed consistent in the sense that the sign of the angle between these two go to zero. As soon as the signal, the signal is great of order greater than D up to three quarters. And this is exactly where this transition I showed you here happens. Because once cosine is greater than three quarters, this spectral initialization is consistent. But it's only consistent, again, as I mentioned, because this doesn't take full advantage of the fact I'm only trying to estimate a singular vector on the shorter side. So the rate is not optimal. So in a way, you can say you had a convergence to you, just very heuristically, but it doesn't converge to you quick enough. How do I make it a quick enough? Well, I do power iteration. And when you do power iteration, then you can end up with the rate optimal estimate. And this is the recipe you put everything together. Now, again, it requires a little bit more calculation moving from this rank one approximation to general case. But nonetheless, it's very much similar to the perturbation analysis I showed you last time. Essentially, all these, all these results, all the, the, one of the main benefits of dealing with odical tensors, odical signals, is even though you are actually having a tensor with rank greater than one, because your load signal is odical, essentially all these perturbations happens in isolation. So you can treat them one by one. Of course, the technical analysis involving dealing with inference from other ones, but really the behavior is you can view them as the building effect of perturbation in isolation. And this allows us to derive essentially the bounds we have for general or echo tensor. Let me just sort of quickly, any questions here? Yes, a question. Sorry, I can't raise yes, my yes. hand because I'm co-host somehow. But anyway, <laughs> sure. uh, the, so for regular tensor uh, approximation, 
You mm -hmm. don't get the best approximation by finding a best rank one and then finding a best rank one of the remainder. That procedure will, will lead you astray. But exactly. in the ODECA world, does that lead you astray also? Or is there some guarantee that that works in ODECA world? That's a great question. If there's low lawyers, it always works. The reason is, in the, if there's low lawyers at all, let me come back here. Maybe this ought to answer your question. So if there's low lawyers at all in the ODECA world, precisely ODECA world, this rank one subtraction always works because when, high, when probability one, when the random initialization, you will always end up with one of the triplets in the decomposition. So by subtracting one doing this sort of success of rank one approximation, you should be able to recover the precise decomposition for Odaiko tensor. Now having said this, if you add a lawyer to it, then it's no longer Odaiko. And I guess what, what, what we discussed here, the morale of the story is, it, this algorithm has some robustness towards random perturbation. And we know if the random perturbation is very small, which is translated into my situation, which is a signal to noise ratio very high, it seems like you still have this nice property. But when the signal to noise ratio is lower, then this becomes an open question. At least I don't know the answer if you will go straight again. There's just another question by Luke. I'm now unmuting him. Hey, <clears throat> thank you. I actually wanted to offer a, a suggestion for the previous question as well. But um, mm -hmm. since the eigenvectors of the or orthogonally decomposable tensors are the robust um, mm -hmm. eigenvectors, then you they are they're the like the converging points for the the um there's stable eigenvectors sta stable elements yes. critical points for this yes, power exactly. method, right so then yes the basins of attraction that you get all just kind of funnel to these uh, uh orthogonal um rank one tensors right exactly and then okay good so the other question i was wondering is so you're looking at like the convergence rate or so on but don't you have a large computation to do to compute uh, the small symmetric matrix that, uh, in order to compute SVD for when you're computing U, um, the left singular vector, you have to uh, multiply M times M transpose, which could be a, a massive computation, right? It could have been. Yeah, that's a very good question. So Indeed. That, yes. That Indeed. contributes to the uh, complexity of the algorithm or this curve that you showed in the next slide. Is that the case? Uh, this is not exactly what I showed here, but you made a great point. Actually, I'm I'm being well. You are more advanced than the, the what I try to ask, what I try to address here, because I'm just a sort of here so far. I'm just looking at the two regime. Whether or not there is a polynomial time algorithm to compute the estimate, so I'm not as careful to look at exactly the computational complexity. So indeed, when you look at how to compute the singular value decomposition of this metric of this matricized version of the tensor, it incurs a heavy computational cost in getting you, because essentially you need to multiply a matrix which is well, computing this for a D by D squared matrix. But nonetheless, I haven't been that careful to look at the effect of D or D, D squared. Basically, I'm just saying this is a steel polynomial time of D. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Maybe if there's a low question, let me quickly conclude this part of the talk by going back to this data example I showed you earlier, just to see how this works. I won't spend too much time on it, just want to demonstrate that indeed this works reasonably well on the practical side. So if you recall, this is basically a three-dimensional multilinear array data of about 20,000 genes and 15 different age groups and 16 different brain regions. So when you do this, I think, I guess my main emphasis would be on this part. This is what we would call a square plot. And I think last time, maybe GM or others asked this question about if, if you 
maybe Alex asked this question. So if you do this sort of a approximate, do this principal component analysis, how do I choose the rank? And there are some theoretical ways you could do this, even in a classical PCA case. And I also mentioned in practice, you need some exploratory tools to do that. And the screen plot is one of the most useful. Because we're assuming the two signals are identical, this allows us to essentially separate the, var the variation in the data by representing them when each one of the elementary tensor in the odaiko decomposition. And so what this bar represents for is if you just take that component alone, take the first component, how much variation in the data explains, in the original data explains, how much the second component explains, and so on and so forth. So basically you can tell from the first three components explains up to like, if I don't remember the exact number, I think it's over 90% of the variation. So there's a very strong signal in the first few components. And in a way, just a sort of is like in any of the exploratory data analysis, you want to look at these factors to see if they make sense. And in a way, uh, this agrees with some of the existing theory about, about the brain development. I just want to point out to the first one. If you look at the first component for the time period, for the age group, and you will see the first seven, actually you see are increasing and then stabilize. And if you go back to the age group I showed you earlier, this happens to be pre, pre this is the fit, this is the pre later one, and then these are sort of afterwards. So basically, this are, these are the brain functions that were developed as a fetus. And so this is a very commonly believed in many of sort of this sort of developmental biology. And a sort of, if you look at the spatial one, actually this is a way of representing the state spatial pattern. Basically this, you can see the pattern, the darkness of the, darkness of the dots indicates the weight. So you can see again, you can see a very nice smooth spatial pattern. Again, agrees with some of the existing biological theory. So anyhow, I'm not claiming I have made a biological discovery here. Just want to show you that with all this machinery in place, and you can have a useful exploratory data analysis tool. And in this particular data set, indeed we find some reasonable, we had some reasonable findings agrees with the existing biological theory. So in this, I'll conclude the part on the sort of the, the unsupervised, unsupervised part. Basically, just to quickly recap, again, I, I'm repeating myself because just because we cut off last time in, in between of it, in the middle of this, this particular portion. So from modeling perspective, I think the tensor, as I argue, the tensor methods are very useful because of enhanced interpretability and the stability. But nonetheless, you need to spend, you need to work harder in terms of modeling. You cannot just say I have a generic tensor PCA and then just do CP decomposition that wouldn't work. From the inference point of view, specifically they are focused on Odaiko decomposable signal. And for the other type of constraints, some of, many of you asked me this question. I don't have a good answer to that yet. Actually this Odaiko is the one we look the most carefully. I'm not aware of any result comparable for other constraints, but I'm sure they're under development probably coming up soon. And from a computational point of view, just like, be, just like I emphasize, it's all about signal to noise ratio. And when the signal to noise ratio is high, the problem computationally becomes easier and you can develop a better algorithm, more efficient algorithm, when essentially the same the optimal statistical performance. Any questions here? Okay, so if not, let me move to the supervised part. But there's one question I just need to unmute. Sure. No, yeah. Please, you should be great. unmuted. Great, yeah. great. Now I think I'm I'm muted. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, maybe before before me you, um, switch to the um, switch to the supervised version. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe could you comment a bit? So maybe you mentioned that these two uh, the possible initialization is crucial. Uh, could you comment a bit like the how random initialization compared to, for example, like the, this unfolded initialization? That's a very good question. Thanks. So if you do run, if you do random initialization, basically you can do the computation. So if you do random initialization, you will need many, many tries 
before you can get close to the global optima. But when the spectral initialization, you are guaranteed, well, at least when the signal to noise ratio is high, you are guaranteed to be close to the global optima. So when random initialization, the good, well, a good practice would, well, then first probably step back. When, when I say random initialization, I think the right way of implementing this is you try many, many initializations randomly and you take the one that's the best. And this procedure wouldn't work very well because the chance of you getting close to the global optimal as a good initialization is very, very low. So you need to be able to do a lot of random initialization before you can get the two more likely close to the global optimum. But when a spectral initialization, you are guaranteed with high probability to be close to the global optimum. So it's, again, it can be translated into computational complexity. I see. So maybe for the spectral initialization, when you see with high probability, which quantity do you mean? Like in the noiseless case, where is this probability comes from? Uh, could you say that again? So, my, so for the spectral initialization, you said mm -hmm. like with high probability, it will hit the global optimum um, like in some guaranteed way. So I was wondering when you see this high probability, like I see. in which sense, yeah. like do we mean like the, in the noiseless case, but then, then why is this probability comes from? No, actually it's in the noisy case. Oh, I see. I you, see. you can I always see. get a pathological data set. Mm -hmm. There's always a chance, the probability is very small, but there's always a chance you can get a pathological case where this doesn't work. It's just like even without lawyers, you can only say, well, there's a major zero set mm -hmm. as an initial value, they wouldn't converge to one of these robust eigenvectors. But you, it's, it's a lot, of, you're a lot guaranteed, but to get there, you essentially, you you have random initialization, essentially when probability one, you are guaranteed to, well, you, you can get a, one of these robust eigenvectors, but there is a major zero set. If you start mm -hmm. there, then you wouldn't. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Now I understand. Yeah, that is actually exactly my confusion because I thought there are some special cases when we use a spectral initialization, if the matrix singular value has to happen to be have some degeneracy, like multiplicity, then we still can get. So like it's in the sense of like those those bad points are in measure zero set. Exactly, exactly. Oh, great, yeah. thanks. Other questions? Okay. Now let's move on to the more supervised setting. Again, I'm going to look at one of the simplest example of a supervised case, which is basically linear regression. So this is a sort of a, a little bit heavy in notation, but the idea is very simple. Let's just look at, think about a practical problem as a sort of a way of understanding the location. Suppose I can take brain image. I want to predict whether or not this particular individual eventually down the road will develop say Alzheimer. So the X will be your brain image. If you think about the image as pixels on a 3D lat three dimensional lattice, so your X will be a multilinear array of dimension three. And your response will be zero, one, basically whether or not this individual will develop Alzheimer down the road. What I want to figure out is this tensor T, which is a, well, this multilinear array T here, which is also three dimensional. Basically, you can think of this as three dimensional lattice of weights. And you have a weight for each of the pixel. You want to do a linear combination of the intensity of each pixel and translate this into a decision rule on whether or not this person will develop Alzheimer down the road. And of course, there are many such examples. You can think about X as a generic video or image and you want to extract certain features so you can predict down the road. If you have a new image coming in, you can predict the response. But nonetheless, if you write this in full generality, this is what happens. Your X is order M tensor, multilinear array, actually to be precise. And your Y is N minus M dimension, or N minus M order multilinear array. And your coefficient is going to be Nth order multilinear array. So this inner product basically happens when the products 
happens when so basically you sum over the product of indices corresponding of the first n of lambda. Nonetheless, throughout this, through, for, for the rest of my talk, actually, you can just think about why is a scalar. So basically, n equals to m plus one. Then basically, your x is mth order, t is mth order, and then so like the inner product is just the usual Euclidean style inner product. And again, I'm going to just think about the case when the law is just a Gaussian for simplicity. So this is the test. Now I observe independent copies of X and the Y. These are my data. So this is how the gen data generating mechanism, if you think about the modeling perspective. Now I observe, observe data XI and YI. And I ask myself, how do I estimate this T? And this is basically the question here. Well, just want to draw a little bit of comparison with the previous case. Previously, I talked about this tensor SVB basically is based, based on the CP rank. And here I'm going to move to a different rank. Essentially, it's very much, this is something JM talked about earlier as well. So this is a multilinear rank. And why is this the case? Well, mostly I think this is because this is more manageable from an estimation point of view. The reason we want to stick with the CP rank in tensor SVB is because of this interpretability, because of this idea of latent factors. Naturally, this ties together when you sort of decomposition into elementary tensors. Now, when we we'll move on to regression, and the idea the notion from at least from a statistical point of view is you want to have a balance in statistics we'll call essentially bias and variance trade-off. What this means is the following. I want to estimate the parameter t. And this t, of course, usually could be full rank, but it could be really low rank. So I want to find a set to approximate this t. And I want to balance our, my ability to estimate from a smaller set, which is measured by variance. And the approximation error basically is how far away is your two parameter from this smaller set. And one of the good notions, just one example, would be, for example, sparsity. And here, turns out in the regression case, it's better to think in terms of multilinear ranks, or this, of course, sometimes referred to as Tucker ranks. As JM discussed earlier, basically here, I'm just a, sort of a, rephrasing this in a more elementary way. If you think about, if we have a third order tensor, which is of dimension D1, D2, D3, what is tied together is a so-called Tucker decomposition. Basically, I can write down a basis for the three different indices and call it a UV and a W. And believe me, when this core tensor, which is of a smaller dimension, R1, R2, R3. More precisely, basically this R1, R2, R3 are essentially the dimension of the linear space spanned by the fibers of this original tensor if you look at these fibers from different modes. And obviously one thing we don't have is the miracle or the pathological cases that JM mentioned here when we move to tensors, is that all these three ranks typically they are different. But nonetheless, for argument's sake, let's just say we indeed, we assume this sort of, this coefficient of tensor T is low rank in the sense that all its multilinear ranks are upper bounded by R. So this is a basic setup. I have a regression problem as I showed here. I'm assuming this T, this coefficient of tensor, is of low rank in the sense that all its multilinear ranks are upper bounded by R. And the question here is, how do I go ahead and estimate T? Well, the most straightforward way is to do MLE, but again, there are many issues, many challenges with MLE. So actually this not only just comes up in the tensor case, in many other situations as well. And one general recipe to deal with these kind of challenges is a so-called convex regularization. The idea is as follows. Again, my data are these pairs of xi's and yi's. Keep in mind, if I plug this A as a true T, the true coefficient of tensor, then the difference basically is just my noise. So the first term, what this does, if you think about regression, well, how regression works, I want to find a coefficient of tensor A so that Essentially, this fits the data well. In what sense? I look at this. Basically, is my fit. I look at if I have a 
May in the future, if I observe XI, I would predict why I'm using it, using the inner product PA and XI. So the first term is just basically a sum of squares. Measure how well you fit the data for a given tensor coefficient of tensor A. And the second part is what we call a regularization term. This lambda is a tuning parameter, is a scalar, is a long negative scalar. And this part, this is what we would call a regularizer. And depending on the context, you can choose many different regularizer. Basically, this is a functional on this third order tensor. There are three main ingredients to put this recipe in use. The three main ingredients are as follows. The first one is what we call weakly decomposable. I know this is a particularly if you are seeing this for the first time, this may look a little bit simple, a little bit sort of a kind of mysterious why we have this concept. But the idea basically is the follows. If you think about in the case of tensors, as I mentioned, I know this the two coefficient tensor is of low rank. But in this formulation, low where I have used this fact. So basically what I want to do is the following. If you give me any tensor A, I want to decompose this into a sum of two parts. One is actually of low rank, not only of low rank, it's exactly what I wanted. In the linear subspace, I would call B here. And then the other one would be perpendicular to that. So basically I write this into a sum of two things, B plus A transpose, A perpendicular. What I want is the following. When I put on a regularization, I want the regularization to be greater than a, a positive constant multiplied by the regularization of B and then the regularization of A perpendicular. The reason I do this is to ensure because I want to minimize this. When I try to minimize this, I'll try to shrink this part to zero. So this is what we call weak decomposability. Weak, weak decomposability. Yes, Jim? Okay. Jim, you have a question? Uh, yeah, Sandra, I think he's trying to unmute him. Yeah, I, I'm doing, I think I, yeah. Travel Jim, you can. Someone is muting him again. Go ahead and click it again. There you go. Can you hear me now? No. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm confused about your notation. So, mm -hmm. so is this color? You have three different A's. Mm -hmm. One the space. One's an element, and the, so what is the the calligraphic A? The the second. Oh, the, oh I see. So sorry about. Sorry about this, Jim. This indeed is bad notation. I'm putting several things together, so I'm using A all too often. So the calligraph A here, this particular one here, is a linear subspace. So in a way, this is a subset of all possible cubic, cubic tensors. Okay, and what kind of subspace is it? Uh, in this case, actually, uh, in this particular case, if we look at a low rank tensor, this would be just all cubic tensors. In other situations, you may have you may want to choose a different subset, but here you can think of this just as all the cubic tensors. Yeah. I see. And then um, you, you you pick a particular tensor. Mm -hmm. And so oh, and B is another subspace, I see. Okay. Yes. So B in this case, for example, let's just say B is a B is all cubic tensors whose linear space, who the linear space spanned by its, its fibers coincides with that of, that of the two, two, two coefficient tensor. So maybe, yes. So let me come here. So you can think of B as a space where you can vary this core tensor by the preserving UV and the W. So you, you have the same, you, you have the same linear space spanned by the fibers but you can vary the core tensor. So this way you have two spaces. One is all, all, all third order tensors. The other one is all third order tensors that has the right linear subspace. And so if this is the case, obviously the issue here, why we want to do this, maybe let me explain a little bit further. Why we want to do this? Suppose we low UV and W. This is no longer a high dimensional problem. And this is basically the premises of low rank methods. 
because lambda dimension is determined by the core tensor alone. So the issue is the challenge of high dimensionality is we don't know UV and W. So the idea basically is if I can, by using this regularization, I can force your estimate to be in this space where you have UVW here already specified, then you can get a very good estimate. But nonetheless, since you can't, so you are allowing for a generic tensor, which is B plus A perpendicular, you want to have a regularization so you can force the second term to be zero. So you can end up with a tensor which has the right singular, the right singular spaces, basically. Okay, I think I got it now, thanks. Other questions? So the second one is more technical, maybe I guess for the, for the interest of time, probably I'll skip the second one. Basically it has to do with the norm, how, how the regularization compared with the Frobenius norm, which is the loss function we use. The more important one is the third one, is the so-called Gaussian wave. The Gaussian wave is a measure essentially of how complex a particular space is. And this of course is introduced by Gordon in 1988. So the idea is if I have a regular 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 R here, I can look at the unit ball with respect to this particular regularizer. And the complexity of this unit ball can be measured as follows. Basically here, this G will be just a Gaussian random vector. I look at the inner product of these two. A is arbitrary instance form. Now I'm, you can vectorize everything. So I'm looking at the A form this unit ball. I look at the inner product because G is Gaussian with the independent entry. So the inner product is also a Gaussian. But now I take a supreme, I take expectation, and this is the Gaussian weights of the so-called unit ball when respect to the convex regularizer are here. When this three lotion, basically a very general result you can get is the following. If you do this regression, if you use this convex regularization with this R here, which is regularizer, satisfy these properties, then this is what we can say. You want to always choose this tuning parameter lambda to be greater than the Gaussian wave of the unit ball with respect to the convex regularizer divided by one over square root n, where n is a sample size. With this, you can ensure that you average your mean squared error. You think about your true coefficient tensor is P, which is d by d by d. You look at the square root for Bennett's norm divided by how many entries you have. So this is basically the mean squared error. The mean squared error is going to be upper bounded by, actually, with this is the, this is basically the part I, the second part I skip, skip, skipped. Basically, this is constant. You think about this as a constant, multiplied by lambda squared. And so what you end up with is one over n multiplied by the squared Gaussian width of the unit ball with respect to the convex regularizer. So this is a general result you can derive. And along the last, now what I'm going to do is to think about the more specific situations on what we can get here. Before we move on to talk about the more specific low rank case, I just want to give you several simple exa simpler example to look at what you can derive from these general results. The first one is just to think about entry-wide sparsity. Suppose your true coefficient of tensor only has a small number of long zero entries. Let's call it S1 number of long zero entries. Well, this usually, this is basically a typical sparse regression case. You, you can forget about the multilinear multi race situation. You are just running linear regression. With a, large, with a very small number of long zero entries. And what you can choose, this is what you, basically is the L1 norm penalty. And this oftentimes referred to as the last in statistics. So basically the penalty is a sum of the absolute value of all the entries. And then you can apply the result I showed you in the previous slide, end up with this very typical result, which is S1 log D divided by N. And this is a very nice result in the sense that, well, basically, imagine this is your original problem, which is d by d by d. Now d only appears in the form of log d. And only this s1, which is a number of long zero entries, 
appear here you know, without a log logarithm. So what happens is if your sample size is greater than the sparsity, the number of non-zero entries is greater than log D, then you should be able to estimate it well, at least in the mean squared error sense. So you can afford to look at a very, very large cubic tensors so long as it doesn't have many non-zero entries. You can do the same thing with a fiber-wise sparsity. For example, you look at the fiber, the, fi the fiber through the third order mode. Basically, you end up with this form, but I suppose say most of the fibers are zero. There are only a small number of fibers that are not zero. And here, what you can do is use this commonly known as a group lasso type of penalty. Basically, you sum up the L2 norm of each of the fiber. And suppose S2 denotes how many non-zero fibers you have. Now again, you have a mean squared error, which is S2 multiplied by D divided by N. And just want to emphasize a little bit, you'll probably ask, what's the dimensionality of this, this, these spaces? Suppose I have S2, which is how many long zero fibers I have. That basically means the number of long zero entries I have can be up to S2 divided by uh, S2 multiplied by D. So in a way, in this case, it shows it's better to use this sort of group lasso penalty instead of lasso penalty, because you, if you use a lasso penalty, you will have actual log D. Similarly, you can move from fiber sparsity into this slice-wise sparsity, where you want to use the norm, which is now each slice, while well, you look at the sum of the norm of each slice. And again, you end up with a similar result. So these are sort of a, how to exploit the sparsity using a general result. But nonetheless, what we are interest, mostly interested in here is low rankness. So again, we want to do this re regression. And what happens here is in this regression setup, we have this sort of coefficient of tensor, which is of low rank. And again, before we look at a higher order tensor, it's helpful to think of, to look at the situation where you have matrices. And in the matrix case, the best way to exploit the low rank, low rank list is by using the so-called nuclear law. So the nuclear law of a matrix is a sum of its singular values. And so you probably think about how do I end up with this sort of weakly decomposability? Whether or not this, uh, this nuclear law is indeed is weakly decomposable. Well, the idea basically is to using to use this so-called PT inequality. So I have a matrix. I can divide this matrix into essentially its nuclear law to be lower bounded by this P1 and P2 are the column spaces and the row spaces of your matrix. So you can always lower bound the nuclear norm of a matrix by basically, if it, as, as this figure illustrates, the nuclear norm of this part and the nuclear norm of this part. Because for any matrix A, I can divide this into a sum of four different parts, basically by looking at the tensor product of a column space and the problem, the orthogonal complement of the, your column space, row space, and the orthogonal complement of row space. The pinching inequality says the nuclear norm is always lower bounded by the nuclear norm of this part and the nuclear norm of this part. And this allows us to establish decomposability. And then we can use the general results to bound the mean squared error, which is Rd log D divided by M. R is the rank of the matrix. So this is, of course, in the matrix case, in the tensor case, things become a little bit more interesting, mostly because how do we define nuclear law becomes a little bit tricky. The very first attempt is by matrixization. So I showed you this figure before. Basic idea is if I have a D by D by D tensor, I convert this into D by D squared matrix. If the tensor is of low rank, you would be at the Tucker rank or CP rank, when I unfold it, they're still going to be of low rank. And if I want to exploit a low rank list in the matrix, as I showed in the, in the previous slide, you can use basically nuclear matrix nuclear norm. Same idea here. So if I want to exploit the fact that I have a tensor which is of low rank, I simply matrixize them and look at the nuclear norm of the matrixized version of the tensor. <clears throat> 
And obviously, there are three different ways. If I look at a third of the time, so there are three different ways I can do matrixization. So it's a good practice. We don't want to say one, one, one mode is sort of is more dominating than the other. Then basically, one way of doing this is to put them on equal footing. By looking at the nuclear law of the first one, nuclear law of the second one, nuclear law of the last one, and then you average them. Now, you can do the analysis using the general result. You need basically the decomposability. You still have decomposability, but here the decomposability goes in the following way. This is just a generalization of the pinching inequality for matrices. So I look at the three dimensions, three different modes. I, P1 represents the linear space spanned by mode one fiber. P1 perpendicular is the orthogonal complement to it. Similarly, you define P2 and P2 perpendicular, P3 and P3 perpendicular. Just like in the matrix case, you have row space and orthogonal complement of that, column space and orthogonal complement of that. And just like a matrix case, I look at the tensor product of all these three different possibilities, and then I end up with eight different pieces. And allow is a simple exercise to divide to divide these eight pieces into Q and Q perpendicular. Basically, we just count how many orthogonal complements you have. If it's less than or equal, it's less than or equal to one, basically zero or one, I put it into the space Q. If it's more than one, I put it in the Q, into space Q perpendicular. And then you can derive, you gave me any third order tensor, if I define the matrices of nuclear law as follows, as here, then basically you will have, it can be lower bounded by, basically in this corner alone, is matrices of nuclear law plus the nuclear law in the perpendicular space. And this, way, this decomposability immediately allows us to derive again another bound for the mean squared error. Yes, Jim. Jim, you have a question? Uh, just a moment where we're... Well, yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, so, yeah. Um, so can you explain why you did this particular choice of norm, this matricized nuclear norm, and if there's any um, theoretical guarantee that this is a reasonable choice? Yes, well, the short answer to that is, this is the first thing people tried. <laughs> The reason is, this is why I started with the matrix case, because people begin to look at a high order tensor case after we have a good understanding about what happens in the matrix case. And in the matrix case, this is actually a very good way of doing things, basically using nuclear law as a proxy to, the, to essentially to the rank, as a convex relaxation to rank. So if you want to use the same idea for tensor, and of course, we, we all know that we run, well, just like you mentioned earlier, we all run into all kinds of troubles in dealing with tensors. So one simple thing to do is to think about how I can tie this with the matrices. And so this becomes essentially a very natural idea. I convert tensors into matrices and look at this sort of a matrices of nuclear law as a way of approximating, as a way of sort of a is a convex relaxation to the low rank assumption of, of the original tensor. So this is the first proposal people, people had in the, in the literature and actually many people use this idea. And nonetheless, why it works, this is essentially what, I, what we try to explain here. Why it works is because this also falls into this category as I showed you earlier, sort of this general theory about the convex regularization because of this sort of generalization of pinching inequality, you can establish this works reasonably well in the sense that you can end up in a good and a reasonable rate of convergence. But very shortly, I would argue, this is not good enough. You can do better than this. Does this answer your question, Jim? Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe we... This is exactly a good point to move on because again, just like I said, this is the first thing tried and it's reasonable, but it's not very good. The reason is very simple. The reason is if you look at this guy here, this RD squared, 
And obviously, this draws comparison with what I showed in a sparse case. In a sparse case, the best scenario you end up with is just a log D over A. So that means we can look at a very high dimensional case. Even in this case, you end up with an SD. So in this case, we end up with D squared. But nonetheless, if you think about it, if I tell you the tensor itself, its multilinear ranks are upper bounded by R, you think about how many free parameters you will have or in terms of the dimensionality of that space. You would think this is going to be of the order Rd, well, at least for R is small, actually the maximum of when Rd and R cube. Nonetheless, here you end up in Rd squared, which is suboptimal. So then you ask, well, can we do better? Well, at least uh, theoretically, indeed you can. The idea basically is very simple. If you think about what actually happens here, so we get Rd squared. This is because we did a matrixization. And when you do matrixization, you lost the tensor structure to a, to a certain degree. And this turns out to be fatal here. So one way of rescuing this is to essentially let tensors be tensors. Again, using the same idea, if you want to use nuclear, use nuclear alum for tensors, probably instead of doing this matrixized tensor nuclear alum, we can do directly do tensor nuclear alum. And this is what we could, what, what, what we suggest to do here. Exactly what do we mean by tensor nuclear norm here? We just define tensor nuclear norm as the dual of the spectral norm. The spectral norm basically is the maximum inner product. Well, the spectral norm of a, of a tensor is defined as the maximum inner product between X and, a, and an elementary tensor whose norm is one. So the nuclear norm is just its dual. Let's define it as dual. Obviously, if a tensor is odical, the matrix size of nuclear norm and nuclear norm is the same, but in general, they are different. Now we have this nuclear norm defined. The K here would become whether or not we still have this decomposability. Turns out you do. You have this weak decomposability. Basically, if you compare with a matrix sized version, the matrix sized version if you recall, is here. So you will divide this into eight different pieces. So the matrix as a nuclear norm of a random of a tensor is up is lower bounded by the nuclear norm in this corner, and the nuclear norm of the rest in the four pieces with at least the two orthogonal complements. And similar things could be established for the for the, for, for, the, for the tensor nuclear norm I defined here, we're not doing matrixization. But here, there's a 1k difference. Instead of getting one, I'm getting one half here. But nonetheless, this is good enough for my purpose because my goal here is to establish a rate of convergence. So again, meaning that I'm a little bit casual when a constant. So being the one or one half, it doesn't make a huge difference for my purpose. But nonetheless, with this, it goes a long way. All of a sudden, I can show the mean squared error is of the order R2, R squared D over N. How do I get this? Again, this is through the computation of Gaussian width, which is a lot of surprising because in a way, this nuclear norm is much tighter. So in a way, the, the unit ball on the nuclear, this nuclear norm is much smaller than the unit ball under the matrix size nuclear norm. So this basically gives me the rates, but of course the heart of it is to verify that we will have this decomposability. Yes, Melian, you have a question? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, um, so here I was wondering in the in your numerator this uh, degree freedom. So for tackle decomposition, like uh, is any word, is any conclusion about the sharpness? Because it seems like this r r square. Because uh, I for tackle decomposition, essentially for factors it's linear in r, but for core it's uh, r cubic. So I was just wondering, like, uh, is that uh, just yes. a technical convenience or some, some difficulty? Uh -huh. Yeah, you are, you are very careful. That's a great question. Actually, this is something I, I, I am going to talk about right now. Actually, this is a lot of optimal because the dimension, the true dimension 
of this parameter space we are looking at, just like in the Taka decomposition case, should it be Rd, the maximum of Rd and R cube. So at least for small r, that should be Rd rather than R squared D. But here, at least for this nuclear law, I'm not sure if it's a due to our calculation or due to our technical difficulties or found more fundamental to tensor nuclear law. But nonetheless, R squared D is the best we can get with this particular method. But there are ways you could get Rd and R cube. But that probably, well, we, we can get results sort of when, when a better dependence on R, but not with this particular method, nor with this particular regularization. Mm. Any other questions? So now, let's come back a little bit to this familiar issue. So far, I've been talking about sort of a general way of doing exploit low rankness in the case of tensor regression. And essentially, we have two different methods I focused on. One is the matrix size of nuclear regularization. The estimation error is suboptimal because of dependence on D. And it is for low rank case, let's just focus primarily on the effect of dimensionality. That's what we're, we're, trying, to, we're trying to lay down here. But it allows for very efficient computation because this, all of this has to do with the matrix nuclear, nuclear law minimization. On the other hand, we have tensor nuclear law regularization. And if you forget about this suboptimal dependence on the rank for a moment, at least for, for low rank, this probably is okay. The depends on, dependence on the dimension D is optimal here. So it's a much better method, but on the other hand, tensor nuclear law is MP hard to compute. So this method itself is not really implementable. So now we are sort of in a very uncomfortable situation. We have a very good method statistically, but it's essentially full as good. You cannot implement. On the other hand, we have a simple method, but you can show it to be suboptimal. The question to ask is, is there a trade-off between the two? The way to understand this is essentially, uh, maybe I have about only about 10 minutes. Maybe we can skip this. Hmm. Yeah, maybe let's, let's skip this part. So this is basically about a good a way, essentially using sum of squares as a way of doing relaxation, uh, how to place this, these two methods in the context of sum of squares sum of squares relaxation with a problem. But nonetheless, the bottom line is, indeed, if you follow this sort of convex strategy, we don't have a good answer yet. Basically, if you want to do a, what, the question is, if you want to do convex regularization, is it possible we can achieve a balance? Basically, we can have a good convex regularizer, which is computationally feasible and statistically efficient. And another question, Still, at least, at least I don't know of any, any answers to that. But what we did try actually is a slightly different approach. If we go beyond the convex approach, is it possible we can do better? And this is actually very now should become sort of a probably more familiar after we look at the tensor SVD case. The answer is yes. And the idea is as follows. It's just like a tensor SVD case. If you can have a good initialization, then it is possible you can get an efficient estimate. So what, is, what do I mean by a good initialization? That basically means you have a consistent estimate. What do I mean by efficient estimate? That means you have optimal rate of convergence. So if you look at these two different scenarios, I can have a good initialization so that it's consistent as long as n is greater than this. But even though when n is greater than this, if you use matrix size nuclear law regularization, the rate is suboptimal. So what I'm claiming to do is the following, just following the same spirit as I emphasize again. If your sample size is large enough, that means your signal to Lloyd's ratio is strong enough. If your signal to Lloyd's ratio is strong enough, then you want to take advantage of that. 
even though you still cannot do nuclear load minimization, you can do something else. And this is how you do it. The idea is very much similar to before. Suppose you have an initial estimate and your initial estimate is close enough to the truth. So this is the truth, actually, should, this should be key, sorry for that, sorry for the typo here. And so your initial estimate is the truth plus noise. Now, suppose this part is reasonably small. Now what you can do is you can look at your initial estimate from your initial estimate to get an initial estimate of U, V, and W. And now you use this initial estimate to do direct laser squares. And this is a point I made earlier. Basically, if you load the two U, V, and W, the problem is easy because it's a lower, it's a low dimensional problem. We are running into so much trouble is because we don't know U, V, and W. Rows are of dimension in terms of degrees of freedom is R multiplied by D. G is of dimension only R cubed, which we can live with. So the issue really becomes here. If I can good, get a good initialization, then I can start minimizing these, these squares more directly. How do I do this? The very simple idea would be, you can just do essentially power iteration. And so here is to make things more precise. Suppose I have an initial estimate of UV and W, let's call it a U tilt, a V tilt, W tilt. I look at the sign of the angle of these linear spaces. If they are reasonably close in the sense that the maximum is smaller than or equal to one half, actually this one half is essentially arbitrary. The idea is as follows, because if you randomly choose a linear subspace, W tilt, and then the random space and W in no dimensional case, I mean, just imagine in one dimensional case. The angle of the two is likely to be 90 degrees. So the sign would be just, <coughs> the sign would be one. So basically what I'm trying to figure out is, I want to make sure the angle is sufficiently small and it's long trivial basically. If that's the case, I can run power iteration. If I run power iteration, I would end up with a mean squared error which is of the order R squared D divided by N. So what does this mean? If indeed my, my sample size is very, very large, I can simply run the matrix size of nuclear loam regularization, which is computable, to give, get a mere estimate which is consistent. But I shouldn't stop there. I should take my estimate and use my estimate only as initial value. And then I should run this power iteration again, in order to get essentially a much better estimate as a final outcome. So this is the alternative to the matrix nuclear or to the tensor nuclear law minimization, but this is computationally feasible. And of course, you would ask, well, in general, are there other initializations you could do? Indeed, there are many other initializations you could do. For example, you can do some of the squares relaxation. Of course, so that's computationally much heavier. Or if you have other information possible, for example, if you know if you load your design, your design tensor is basically RID ensemble, then there are much easier ways to get an initial value. And this will probably require a little bit more calculation, which I, I won't spend much time on it. Uh, I think I'm already out of time. But nonetheless, just one point I want to make before concluding. So far, I try to sort of fix ideas. I try, I try to make things simpler. So I'm assuming everything's Gaussian. But nonetheless, there, there's no reason we cannot go a little bit beyond the Gaussian. For the error and for also for the design, we can always deal with the so-called sub-Gaussian regime. And indeed, for the design for the design tensor, basically is a distribution of all these XIs. We can deal with other types of designs as well. But here things become a little bit trickier. So basically, there are two sources of randomness. One is the regression noise. The regression noise, there are much better ways we can deal with it. But for the design matrix, and much of this machinery I discussed here relies more heavily on the Gaussian assumption. And this, in a way, is also out of necessity. Because if XIs, they have other distributions, then the behavior could be very different. A case in point is a so-called matrix completion case. So you can think about the matrix completion case 
is a regression case where these xi's are just randomly choosing at the colonical basis. Basically, EI multiplied by e, uh, tensor product EJ, tensor product EK. If that's the case, turns out the behavior of all these estimates is quite different from Gaussian design. And here, since I'm running out of time, I want to go into details. But nonetheless, there are some new, there you can also, the same, although the techniques are different, but nonetheless, the morale is similar. Basically, is the following. So the morale basically is, you want to look at, you want to look at your problem, you want to look from the perspective of signal to noise ratio. When the signal to noise ratio is high, it's easier to deal with it. You can always get a reasonable initialization, and then you can go back to the basic power iteration or alternating these squares to refine it. And usually what happens is, if you can get a consistent estimate, you can convert this into an efficient estimate. So in this, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention.